Welcome to Coming Down to Earth, an online summit about conflict transformation that emerged from the intention to explore pathways towards regenerative cultures in a divided world. I'm very happy to have my first uh, guest here today, Guy Burgess. Hi, Guy. Uh, good afternoon. I'm really happy to have you here present today. So deep uh, gratitude for, for you for taking your uh, time to be with us and share a bit of your story and your perspective around uh, conflicts. And uh, yeah, just to say shortly that how, how uh, blessed we are for having the opportunity to have this conversation on, over a very long distance as I'm sitting here in Dili in East Timor it's 10:30 uh, a.m. in the morning here, and you are talking from uh, North America, and it's like uh, end of the afternoon for you. What time is yeah. it there now? It's almost seven, and we're instead of in nice tropical places, we have snow piled high around the house. Wow! So yeah, it's amazing. What's an integrated what planet can... here? Yeah. So. It's amazing what technology allows us to do. So I'm really happy and I uh, want to dive deeply into, into our conversation today. Guy has been at the intersection between research and, and practice around how to deal with conflicts and how to deal with, in a way, intractable problems in the last decade. So our conversation today is going to be around uh, exploring uh, what has he been noticing in the past decades up until today in, in the way we have been in our societies relating with conflict, addressing conflict, and, and yeah, what, what kind of ways have not been serving us um, in these past decades up until today. So, Kai, perhaps you can tell us a bit about what what uh, of your story and how you came to uh, the desire to dedicate yourself to the work around conflicts and intractable problems so tell us a bit about what was your starting point well um i i guess it all goes back to the 60s and early 70s i'm a child of the cold war and the vietnam war and the civil rights movement in the United States. When I first went off to college, this was a pretty turbulent time when people, you know, this was as Martin Luther King and the various civil rights marches, there was widespread civil unrest in the United States, great political upheaval over the war in Vietnam. Um, this was also the very beginnings of the environmental movement. I remember my first image of the environmental movement was a picture in an encyclopedia of a wall of soap suds coming off Lake Erie in the United States, big enough to bury 100 foot trees. And this was a time when my wife was from Cleveland, Ohio. Um, well, the main river that runs through downtown Cleveland kept catching fire because it was so polluted. So this was a time where we were also worried about nuclear war. Um, I grew up in Colorado Springs, Colorado, which we learned as a young child was the number three target in the event of a nuclear war. So we grew up literally to the sounds of air raid sirens and duck and cover drills in elementary school. So getting interested in conflict when we when I went off to college and learned, hey, you can actually study this sort of thing, other, unlike the stuff that you studied in high school, was pretty straightforward. It was a time when lots and lots and lots of people were very interested in this. And the thing that I kept coming back to was that you know, there were all these sort of sensible things that society could do, but they weren't. And the question was why? And that sort of led guided my studies over the years. Uh, we like to say that I was a tenured student at the University of Colorado, which you get for being a student for 10 years. So you start off as an undergraduate, and then you go to graduate school and get a PhD, and it takes 10 years. And that was also a time when I met my wife, Heidi, and we've actually been lucky enough to spend we got our PhDs together in the same summer and been working as partners ever since. 
And so my story is very much like her story. And we went off and the other thing that sort of has characterized our career is that the world keeps changing. And we sort of entered graduate school, studied sociology in the early 70s. And by the time we graduated, the United States concern for the broad range of social justice issues had collapsed. And Ronald Reagan was now president, and the whole world changed dramatically. The other thing that happened in the early 70s, we had the start of the great first wave of energy crises, where uh, there was the Mideast war and the price of oil went up and there wasn't enough. And I remember getting through winters when there wasn't really enough uh, fuel to heat your house. Um, and there was a big time where energy was the big thing. And then it collapsed one day because we figured out how to get more energy in the political system chain. So we prepared for a couple of different careers and the world kept changing out from under us. But in the late 80s, the Hewlett Foundation got the idea to fund a bunch of university-based conflict resolution theory centers and to try to take conflict resolution and peace building and all of that from what used to be an art and turned it into something of a science. And we put together a proposal with some colleagues here for a program at the University of Colorado, which we were lucky enough to have Hewlett fund for almost 25 years. Uh, and we wound up focusing on two things. Uh, one was intractable conflicts. Those are those conflicts that sort of defy the best available conflict resolution techniques. And those seemed to, to us to always be the problem. And not only were the conflicts destructive, and you'd have terrible wars and destroyed relationships and um, in many ways a miserable life, but you also couldn't solve problems because you couldn't agree on anything. And you had the real risk of falling into some sort of authoritarian system, because there were lots of folks out there who like to exploit and profiteer from conflict. Um, but I was I'm thinking about our session today, I realized that if I were to tell this story, imagining that I were just going into college this year, uh, the wars have changed, but the environmental problems have changed, but they're just as serious. And Truth is that conflict is still the ET sticking point. The reason that we can't solve any of our problems is we can't deal with conflicts over how to solve those problems. So it's an ongoing challenge. Uh, we've been trying to talk up the notion that intractable conflict is as serious a problem as climate change. Um, I tell the story of being lucky enough to work for the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Uh, these are the guys who first discovered climate change, uh, 10 years before it ever made the national news. And I remember just overhearing these guys. I, mean, I was just, I just out of graduate school, but and there were these scientists that are used to giving reports at academic conferences and say, hey, you know, we just discovered something that's got a, the, this is a serious problem. And if we can't get the whole planet to really change the way they use energy, we're in a lot of trouble. So they started building a movement and it's taken 20 years from when these first conversations, or 40 years from these first conversations to where we are now. I think conflict's a lot like that. There aren't enough people who recognize how serious the problem is. And we need to start laying the groundwork for what will be a decades long, very challenging effort to improve the way we deal with a wide range of difficult issues uh, that swirl around conflicts all over the world. Yeah, I was, I, I was hearing you and it's quite interesting that you were up in, in MIT in the, in the early eighties when there was this abundance of, of people already very aware of, of the um, 
of the climate um, challenges and and you know like uh, they wrote some of them were part of the group that wrote the limits to growth back in 74 which was actually the year i was born uh -huh. and, and you were mentioning um, something about um, uh, conflict resolution about dealing with intractable problems and that conflict resolution was not working anymore and I wonder if I think like conflict resolution and climate change and the way we have been thinking and approaching those those issues it looks like there's a similar way of looking into them that is not serving us and I wonder what do you think about that because just to be clear about what I'm trying to convey is that climate resolution has this uh, um, look of trying to sort out something, to solve it, to keep it under control or to make it uh, uh, achieve a resolution. Mm -hmm. And I think we often, we often have that narrative also in climate change, uh, especially in the activist uh, field of we have to make the climate work again in our favor. So we have to fix the climate. Uh -huh. And we're really not. And I, I want, I'm curious, like, where did it shift to you the view from conflict resolution or this kind of manicured way to look into the heart of things to a more generative uh, place? Or how how is that? How how do you relate with that? Well, one of the things in this this program that the Hewlett Foundation funded, which uh, led to the Beyond Intractability system, which was, it's an online knowledge base that emerged from the contributions of three or 400 people from all over the world that tried to really understand what made conflict so intractable. And the key insight, I think, is the distinction between complicated and complex systems. Uh, humans are really great tool builders. We think in terms of building tools, of complicated uh, deterministic systems. And the thing about a complicated system is it's a machine. You've got blueprints, you've got designs, you know how it's going to work. And we kept trying to design the social system that way. And it doesn't work that way. It's much better, instead of thinking in terms of mechanical metaphors, start thinking in terms of organic metaphors. The way society works is not that somebody stands back and designs it and everybody does what they're supposed to do. It's that you have multitudes of very independent actors, individual people who are trying as best they can based on the limited amount of information they have. Um, are we all have limits in our ability to analyze the situation? A lot of our analysis isn't very rational. It's emotional, which complicates things, but it, in some ways it may be better. But we're all acting in different ways at the same time. And the way that you address the climate problem or the intractable problem is you need to embrace that complexity and to try to think of the way in which society learns things which it does, or we wouldn't be anywhere near the, we wouldn't have the wondrous ability, for instance, to have conference calls across the planet for essentially no charge. I mean, that is truly amazing. But it's the result of a lot of individual people trying to, in their own way, to make a space in the world, make a bit of a contribution and get some compensation in return. and. That's the kind of learning process that we need to develop and encourage and facilitate and to the extent we can to fund. That's going to be the key to solving climate change. And it's already been pretty impressive. I have a collection of all these amazing ideas that people are coming up with for dealing with one aspect of the climate problem or another. Uh, well, and we've got a pretty good list of great ideas that people have come up with for dealing with various aspects of conflict. And the key is to encourage more people to apply those ideas in more settings. And that sort of nudges the whole system in, in a more positive direction. So looking a bit into, into the, the way 
people have been responding to to conflict and tensions you mentioned one of the one of the key things that that you you realized um, while dealing with intractable problems is the the tendency or the the habitual way to look into it as a as a complicated uh, matter and, and not really complex as in living systems uh, i wonder if you noticed some other things some other patterns or some other habitual ways of, of approaching conflict that you think are preventing us from really moving forward and give that leap step into a different way of, of relating with, with conflict and tension uh, situations? Well, there, there are two kinds of problems that contribute to intractability and are making things so difficult. Uh, some of them is that it's just really, really hard to find ways of getting people from different, you know, we're talking about um, roughly 7 billion people around the world with lots of different personal situations. They live in different environments and different cultures with different economic opportunities and different languages. And getting everybody to sort of work together is an enormous challenge. Um, but there's all, another part of the problem is that, sad to say, but I think it's true, is that there are far too many actors in the world that have figured out how to profit from conflict. And we have unscrupulous politicians who have, through the ages really, employed divide and conquer strategies to divide their enemies and then conquer and oppress them. And the truth is that that's a well-worn path towards authoritarianism and tyranny, and it's very active at the moment in all sorts of places that you, we'd like to, you know, a few years ago we thought that could never happen here, but it is. And it's because people have figured out ways of profiting. Some of it's just, you know, war, selling guns and weapons, but a lot more of it is you get everybody angry with, one, with each other, and then you champion one side and help them win, and then they let you do whatever you want. And that's a problem that we've got to deal with, especially with this new age of globalized, uh, social network-based target cast media where we now have political figures that can use information available on social networks. So right now in the United States, they like gather their, the Political Campaigns Act have access to 3,000 data points on every person to figure out exactly what kind of political perspective they have and what appeals they might respond to. They're able to target them with it's called target casting, where the ads go to specific individuals, but they don't necessarily appear as ads. They can seem like they're just another friend that you trust giving them accurate information, but the information can be all made up. And it's, a, it's these kinds of attacks are going at the sort of very idea of collaboration. So, one of the challenges is to figure out how to push back against this. And this is very daunting. And then there are a whole series of other challenges of, okay, if we're going to push back against that, you've got to have a vision of how we can build a world that everybody wants to live in. And to persuade people that, you know, if you sign on to that vision and help bring it about, nobody's going to double cross you. It'll actually work. And that's another set of problems. Uh, but it's this, it's called disinf, I guess the phrase I use for it is disinformation warfare. It's not even information warfare. You're making it all up. But this is something that's new and that, you know, George, in George Orwell's nightmares, he never dreamed of anything quite this scary. So we gotta, we gotta really look at the hard problems. Um, and I, you know, these are getting scary. Um, but then again, if people catch on to what's happening, uh, then it gets to be a lot simpler. 
or yeah, at least there, there, there's a route to finding a, a solution to it. Yeah, the, the, there's definitely an intractable problem. The, if we look back in, in human history, it's like it's, it's hard to imagine a moment in time where humans were um, profoundly collaborative and, 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 and not acting on this kind of uh, win-lose kind of game. So I, I wonder, like, in your uh, research over the decades and in trying to investigate a bit deeper, um, this issue, if um, if if you have any uh, anywhere along the way, I'm sure if you reflected on the conditions, on the on the contextual conditions that uh, are um, enabling um, people to uh, address conflict and tensions in a healthier way as. Uh, uh, opposite to what's happening these days, and and I, I I I sense with you this this I don't know if you agree with me, but there's this feeling that um, the 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 last 400 years of extreme growth with the with the agricultural revolution, the industrial revolution that took place after the the Renaissance, that we we kind of um, developed this way of thinking that is pretty much based on scarcity somehow and that we need to fight over resources and there's not enough for everybody in this. So I either win or lose, you know, that, that kind of space for me is a really uh, nurture uh, or it's, it's uh, encouraging competition. And so a more uh, a, a place where we tried to we use our privileges to take advantages advantages over others, and that's a bit like what I what I heard from you saying around the way people and, and especially people in dominant um, uh, places in society continue to try to take advantages of other people for their own benefit. So I wonder, like, if if when when looking at this, what what kind of insights came up for you and for for ID and others you were working with. Well, um, think of one way to think about this, and I think almost always you do much better if you think about a problem like this using organic metaphors, ecosystem metaphors, rather than mechanical metaphors. So you can imagine that society is like any other ecosystem. It has lots of individuals and and as well as individuals and different species and all of that. And they're in a competitive relationship at some level. Now, sometimes you can figure out that, hey, if you all cooperate, you'll be better off um, than if you don't. Um, and so you can think about our current situation as kind of a contest, really. On the one hand, you have a competition between folks who think about society as a zero-sum game. That is, they think that the total size of the pie, the amount of wealth and goods and services that are out there, is fixed. And the way to get ahead is by taking something from somebody else. And you have a bunch of people who have this frame in the way they look at the world. And they're in competition with one another. So like any other kind of ecological competition, uh, the strongest one is going to win. So we're getting a whole generation of extremely good people, or effective people, at trying to basically accumulate vast quantities of wealth and power. And so that's one ecological dynamic that's going on. The hopeful ecological dynamic that's going on at the same time is that you have, and this is the world of non-governmental organizations, uh, nonprofits, some socially responsible businesses, uh, educators, religious leaders, lots and lots of people look out at the world and look for opportunities where their opportunity isn't getting something from somebody else but it's figuring out how to do something that's of service to the larger society for which they get some compensation, or figuring out how to join with others to do some, to create something, to create more wealth, 
Um, and so you see these, this fabulous array of interesting things that non-governmental, socially conscious organizations are doing. You see this fabulous array of nifty new technologies that will lead us towards a sustainable global economy that really can provide for the material needs of the population. Uh, pretty much any problem that you want to identify, um, there are folks out there who have some very creative ideas for solving it. And the thing to do is to do whatever we can to strengthen these folks and to make life tougher on the zero sum, I want to get as much as I can, folks. But the ingenuity that's there, and one of the, the sources of optimism um, is in the 70s, when I first started you know, graduate school, and one of my jobs was to do statistical charts. And I remember plotting the day that world population hit 3 billion. And that was when Paul Ehrlich and the population bomb came out. And if you would have gone around and said, in 2020, the world population is going to be 7 billion, and we're coming off of several decades in which global, po global poverty has plummeted, they would have said, you're nuts. If you would have said China and India could become major prosperous technologically advanced societies, people would have said, you're nuts. So things don't, you know, a lot of the pessimism doesn't quite hold up, which is also a source of some optimism. And the reason that you can be optimistic is because you've got all these people and all this ingenuity focused on helping us find ways out of these problems. And you can make a pretty good case that over the long march of history, um, they've been the dominant force. And while you can paint lots of gloomy, scary scenarios, and there, I, as you may have gathered from some of the things I just said, I, I'm a believer in gloomy, gloomy scary scenarios, uh, but, the optimistic ones are also there. And the thing to do is to become part of them. I, I, I'm really curious to hear more about what makes you optimistic. But before that, I would still, I, I would really like to invite you to share a bit of what, what uh, on, on your way in these past decades up until today, what have made you feel at times a sort of despair or disenchanted or did, did you felt any of those things? I'm sure like uh, along the way there were moments of, of deep doubt. So I'm curious to know a bit like what, what made you feel uh, despair over, over the course of your life in dealing with this, in looking at the way people as humans deal with intractable problems and with conflicts in general. Well, um, I, you can look at, you know, I, on whatever dimension you might care to um, focus on, you can look at the history of, go back as far as you can have the time and energy to do, and, and there will be good times and there will be bad times. And there will be terrible tragedies, and then people learn from the tragedies and things move on. And despairing time is when things look like they're going badly and it doesn't take much to paint some scenarios of things that could go truly catastrophically. Um, I think the prime, the responsibility of world leaders, certainly of countries like the United States and Russia and anybody with nuclear weapons is to keep the nuclear genie in the bottle. Um, I grew up or went through a period where one of my jobs was helping a citizens oversight group assess the danger of our local nuclear bomb plant, which was just down the street here. And nobody thought that we would ever stop making nuclear bombs. And now that plant's a wildlife refuge. Um, so things change, but 
Um, another story worth telling, I used to work for a guy named Kenneth Boldy. And one of, he used to be very fond of quoting Murphy's Law. Murphy's Law is this joke, if anything can go wrong, it will. Well, if you add the word eventually, if anything can go wrong, it eventually will, then it becomes indisputable scientific fact. So if you allow some of these risks to persist, even if they're low probability risks, risks of nuclear war, risks of some sort of catastrophic epidemic because we're not investing enough money in public health, uh, risk of climate disasters of one sort or another, then sooner or later they're gonna happen. And it's the persistence of these, uh, well, our, our tendency to tolerate such risks uh, that certainly is, is cause real worry and I try to avoid true despair, it's too depressing. But serious worry, I, I, I do a lot. <laughs> and and what, what so, so turning, turning that upside down, what, what has been uh, a, a source of, of optimism and of, of hope uh, in, in what looks like a hopelessless uh, time? <laughs> Well, what the, the source of hope is just paying attention to all of the clever, brilliant, compassionate things that people are doing. Um, I think that certainly the US media, and I'm pretty sure just about any same can be said for most other countries. Right now, we've got ourselves in a bit of a trap because uh, as news is increasingly distributed over the internet, uh, the publishers of news know exactly how many people read each article. And they know which ones get readership and therefore can sell ads and they tend to focus on them. And if you look even at reputable newspapers like the New York Times or the Washington Post, or um, you know, there's certainly lots of others, um, and you look at their headlines, and they're full of what I call blood boiling stories. That they're things that make you really mad. And what they're doing is they're scanning literally the whole world to find the most outrageous story of the day and get people, and people will look at it. And, Gee, I didn't know that could happen. And it's, it gives you a bias because these, reports, which are at least, you know, in my informal tabulation, 50, 60 percent of a lot of the news um, are relatively, well, they, they're accurate, they're worth paying attention to, but they still only describe a pretty tiny percentage of the human experience. And all of the interesting, positive things, somehow nobody's quite so interested in so they don't get reported on. And part of this, this goes again back to looking at things in evolutionary organic metaphors. And if you think about the evolution of humans, uh, it's always been true that when presented with a new situation, it's prudent to look to see if it's dangerous before you look to see if it's hopeful. Because if it turns out it's dangerous, if you don't take protective action quick enough, you might not get to the hope part. So our brain is wired to give priority to scary, fearful things. And we have to recognize that that's a bias and not and to focus on things that are positive that we not only don't pay attention to, we sort of pay so little attention to them that they don't get the kind of funding that they need. Yeah, I would like to explore a bit more that. I wonder like what's the relationship you see between conflict and tensions and, and the development process? Did, well, how do you see, do you see any function or any utility in it or any relationship? Well, the thing about just, just to say just, just to be clear guys because when i hear you i it, it, my sense is that actually uh, crises crises are needed for us for for 
humans and other living systems to to have the opportunity to to take a, a step to a higher degree of order or let's say a higher order of value so to to you know to continue their developmental path in a way so the, well, the, well there is the the old line that it's a terror it, i forget how it works it's something like a crisis is a terrible thing to waste that if there's a crisis it highlights things that need changing you can use that to mobilize public support and actually achieve something um the truth is unfortunately that there are lots of folks that use crises as a way of mobilizing support for things that make things worse so you have a refugee crisis for instance and that becomes a basis for all sorts of terrible xenophobic responses so you've got to uh, guard against that um we have a um a bunch of colleagues who are involved in peace building which in this context i think is very similar to development and what they look at is that and this goes back to this complicated complex system stuff again um that if you start to come up with a plan on how you're going to build peace or develop an economy um the world keeps changing underneath you and so you well there are, you know stories you decide well hey the the thing to do is to build an economy by allowing fracking and you can become an energy exporter but then if all of a sudden the world decides that we don't want all that energy or you decide that you want to start growing um mandarin oranges and then there's a glut on mandarin oranges and that doesn't work um you've got to have a system that continues to adapt and pay attention to changing situations because the further you look into the future, the more uncertain things get. Um, so what you want to do is to have the flexibility to respond in lots of different ways, depending on different opportunities. I used to play semi-serious chess, and I could plan ahead a couple of two or three moves, and but then it was too complicated. I couldn't do that. So what, what I did was I tried to position myself so I could take advantage of lots of unknown and unexpected opportunity. And you sort of need to do some of that with, um, I think, planning for development or anything else. Is the more diversification, the more ability to respond to very different kinds of situations, uh, the better off you're going to be. And, um, but still, I mean, if there's a, a big crisis that shows that something is really problematic, it can be a way to push change. But you've got to guard against people who are trying to use it the other way. Not quite sure whether I answered your question, but talked around it some anyway. Yeah, kind of. But I, I'm still uh, struck by the, well, by the observation that even though today we have at our disposal uh, the the biggest insights in in ecology and and biology sciences saying that that there's this that everything is connected every, everything is interdependent and that so our ecosystems health uh, affect our health and and vice versa so everything is really interdependent and so the same if we think about people that we we know that when we collaborate for the greater good that actually uh, things get better for everybody i think nobody wakes up in the morning and says on one side well i'm going to destroy my ecosystem or i'm going to fight with everybody i meet on the street or or even i'm going to wake up and fight against myself because we also kind of realize and i think the the the, the last couple of decades has been quite growing sense of many people and particularly young people this sense of i don't want to fit a, a predefined role for myself i want to go and search for meaning and for purpose and to, to try to bring my gifts into into the world but none of the, we still disconnect in, in all of these different levels so there's still a conflict inside of us about what 
about you know wanting to be uh, to have a purpose and to serve uh, life and to be seen by others in that process to want to connect with each other and to be um, deeply connected with their ecosystems but it seems like it's it's often frustrating for me that we we we're not giving those steps maybe with the speed that I would like. And so there's a bit of frustration in that. And I wonder how you, how you see that. Um, well, I think that there's been a trend. And if you look historically, and you don't have to go back very far, but the further back you go, probably the worse it is. The history of, most parts of the world is has lots and lots of stories of various groups of one sort or another who for one reason or another have been oppressed and discriminated against and so on the one hand we're living through and certainly the last half century has been one in one of awakening where various groups are coming to challenge their oppressed state in the society uh, to demand sort of equal and fair treatment. There's a lot more focus on the individual identity groups and historical heritage and pride that comes with that. And basically it's a lot of groups that are demanding a, a, a place at the table, uh, which is all a step in the right direction. But what we've started to do so much is by focusing on all of the injustices of the past, and a lot of these are what we call unrightable wrongs, that there's nothing that can ever be done to remedy those other than maybe crafting a future vision in which we would all be proud to live. Um, but this focus on identity and the champion in, of one's own group, I think we've lost, or maybe we never really had, but what we need to have to accompany this kind of diversity is a much stronger sense of a commonality that crosses that. And so people don't see it as my group versus your group. It's they have a sense that, okay, all groups are committed to this baseline level of common values and the way in which we will treat others. And that becomes the basis for a lot of this collaboration. The other thing that sort of drives this is that the globalization of the world economy has brought people into contact with, one, with much more disparate groups, much more than they ever were before. Um, one of the stories I tell my students is that um, one of the things that they have to be thankful, at least in the United States, and I think this is probably true worldwide, to Ronald Reagan for is he deregulated the airlines. And it used to be government regulation of airlines um, had the prices of airplane tickets way up. And what happened was that part deregulation was part of it. Part of it was just advances in aircraft. Uh, but the cost of international travel has plummeted. And my kids are in a generation that's sometimes called the first globals. They're the first generation of people who were relatively free about traveling the world. And my generation, when I grew up, that you had to be really rich to be able to do that. Um, so that there's wonderful things associated with it, but it brings tensions into the system. The other thing that um, brings tensions in, in the United States, I've looked at ele uh, election results and the counties that are most hostile towards immigrants are the counties that for the first time are getting large immigrant populations that they've never had before. And it's a transition issue that you've got new newcomers and it takes a while to develop relationships. And we do a whole lot better if we focused a lot on building relationships across these divides. 
Yeah, that, that raises a particular issue and we think that the future is going to be made of a huge level of migrations, uh, human migrations, if we consider the way climate is going to, to continue to roll out and, and the need for people to move from places to others. And we already started to observe that. So yeah, that's really interesting. And I wanna say, thank you so much for, for bringing the identity issue. It seems to me that that's also crucial in the sense of how can we as individuals, as human beings, um, be more familiar and aware of how uh, our identity is not fixed and actually is much porous and we can have uh, different levels of, of inclusiveness to the level of saying that my identity is global. I think I, I, I'm one of those and I think most probably you that feel in that space of relating with other human beings from all around the globe in, in a very um, um, close way and not not in the kind of dynamics of us and them you know so that's that's really a key issue for for these days and i'm particularly um aware of that as i as i told you before we started recording that uh this weekend there was a big this big uh, issue in portugal around uh racist chance on a football match and one of the players uh, of african origin uh, had to decided to leave the the the, the pitch and uh, stop playing, and there's a huge issue now around uh, Portuguese uh, society having to face uh, racism uh, deeply embedded in it, and so there's this dynamics also of shutting those voices out of saying, "Oh, you are these bad people that that have this they sing this song this racist chant." So. Yeah, that's pretty much alive also in the in this narrative of us and them that so easily make it divisive and i think that's quite really present in the states these days but also in other parts of the world i just came from india there's a big issue there with the new laws that Modi is trying to implement that that kind of again raised the divide between uh, hindus and muslims and and other minority groups in india so these things are also quite present in different parts of the world And I would like to invite you just to, to kind of make some final comments, if you want, as we try and come to a close in our conversation. Uh, it has been really a great, a great talk. So just before I close, I'd really like to see if you have any, anything that you want to add that you feel it's important to highlight. Well, uh, there's a story that I like to tell um, that I think gives us a sense of not only what it's going to take, uh, but the kind of commitment that it that it's going to require. Uh, when I was a kid, um, polio was widespread. One of my good friends had it. Uh, we were all terrified about it. Um, and then one day, and I still vividly remember going down to my elementary school. And there was trays and trays of sugar cubes with a pale purple dye on them. And that was the polio vaccine. And we all ate a sugar cube and that was the end of polio. And there was a period um, in the conflict resolution field uh, after uh, the book Getting to Yes was first published. Outlining, outlining principled negotiation and how you work out win-win agreements and all of that. And that was sort of seen as the polio vaccine for conflict, that, hey, this is the pan, this will solve everything. And then a few years later, uh, Richard Nixon, um, despite his many problems, he had the idea of launching a war on cancer and he figured that well cancer is just another disease uh we will spend a bunch of money on it pretty soon there'll be a vaccine and that will be that so we're now 50 years into the war on cancer and we've discovered that it's not something that's going to get fixed with a simple vaccine is actually an enormously complex series of class of diseases. 
It's taken us decades worth of basic research to understand not only the human genome, but the genome of various cancers. And they're all, and, and there's been slow but steady progress in applying this basic research to act, development of actual treatments. And the treatments are slowly getting better. And it's not as scary a disease as it once was, but um, we've had good friends still die of it almost every year. And cancer or conflict is a bit like that, or at least these big intractable conflicts. I mean, there is not going to be a simple solution. It's going to take decades of basic research, applied research, slowly getting better at the way we treat individual conflicts. And over time, we'll get better at it. But we've got to be prepared for a long, tough haul on it and not expect simple, easy fixes. But the future we live to our grandkids and our great grandkids depends on what we do about it now. Yeah, and I would say, uh, as I heard you, I was, I was thinking also that it's not like we're going to arrive a uh, final destination where we're going to get rid of any sort of conflict and intractable problems. They will all, always be present as a kind of an invitation for us to, you know, stay with the trou trouble long enough that we can make those quantum leaps in our, in our human development. So, uh, Guy, thank you so much Early. for your time. Oh, I enjoy it very much and look forward Deep to gratitude. the rest of your conference. It'll be great fun. Yeah, and I, I think we'll have a second conversation for, for next week. So looking forward for that. Thank you so much for your time and for sharing your experience, your perspectives, your wisdom. It has been really a pleasure. So thank you. Great. Thank you.